Well, I have a message that God has really burned on my heart that I want to share with you today. And just open your hearts to receive what God has for you. I think it will be life-changing for all of us. Amen? Amen. Do we love the Word of God? Do we love to see the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives? All right, well then let's get to it. Lord God, we love you. God, we are here for you. Lord, we just give you all the worship and all the glory and all the power and all the praise, Lord God, because you alone are worthy. God, you are the reason we are here. We live for you, Lord Jesus. And God, we ask that you would have your way today. God, that you would speak to us, Lord God, that you would challenge us, that you would change us, God, that you would use our lives for your glory. God, we want you to have the preeminence in this place, in our lives, Lord God. So speak, Holy Spirit, what you've given for us for this day. And Lord, we give you the thanks in advance. And God, we have open hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, there's a historical account I wanted to share this morning. It starts like this. He wanted to join the Marines, but he was too short. The paratroopers wouldn't have him either. Reluctantly, he settled on the infantry and ultimately became one of the most decorated heroes of World War II. He was Audie Murphy. He was the baby-faced Texan farm boy, Texas farm boy who became an American legend. Murphy grew up on a sharecropper's farm in Hunt County, Texas. After his father deserted the family, he helped raise his 11 brothers and sisters, dropping out of school in the fifth grade to earn money picking cotton. He was 16 year old, years old when his mother died, and he watched as his siblings were doled out to orphanages or to relatives. Seeking escape from this difficult life, Murphy enlisted in the army in 1942, falsifying his birth certificate so that he appeared to be 18 one year older than he actually was. Following basic training, Murphy was assigned to the 15th Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division in North Africa. And I'm a veteran. I served in the 3rd Infantry as well. And this guy is well known in our unit. First entering combat in July of 1943 during the invasion of Sicily, he proved himself to be a proficient marksman and a highly skilled soldier. He consistently demonstrated how well he understood the techniques of small unit action. Murphy landed in Salerno, Italy, to fight in the Voltuno River campaign, and then to Anzio to be part of the allied forces that fought its way to Rome. Throughout these campaigns, Murphy's skills earned him advancements in rank because many of his superior officers were being transferred, wounded, or killed. After the capture of Rome in June of 1944, Murphy earned his lurst his first decoration for gallantry. Shortly thereafter, his unit was withdrawn from Italy to train for Operation Anvil Dragoon, the invasion of southern France that began on August 15th of 1944. During seven weeks of fighting in that successful campaign, Murphy's division suffered 4,500 casualties, and he was to become one of the most decorated men in his company. But his biggest test was yet to come. On January 26th in 1945, in a village of Holtzvia in eastern France, Lieutenant Murphy's forward position came under fierce attack by the Germans. Against the onslaught of six panzer tanks and 250 infantrymen, Murphy ordered his men to fall back to better their defenses, alone. He mounted an abandoned uh, burning tank destroyer that could have blown up at any second and with a single 50 caliber heavy machine gun contested the enemy's advance. It was a pretty brave stand. Wounded in the leg during the heavy fire, Murphy remained there for nearly an hour, repelling the attack of the German soldiers on three sides and single-handedly killing 50 of them. His courageous performance stalled the German advance and allowed him to lead his men into a counterattack, which ultimately drove the enemy from Holtzvia. For this Murphy was awarded the Medal of Honor. He was a great guy. It's the United States' highest award for gallantry. And if you served in the Army, you understand. 
By the end of World War II, Murphy had become one of the nation's most decorated soldiers, earning an unparalleled 28 medals, including three from France and one from Belgium. Murphy had been wounded three times during the war. In May of 1945, when Victor was declared in Europe, he had still not reached his 21st birthday. We love a good heroic story, don't we? We love when you see people stand against evil and against overwhelming odds. We love the underdog, don't we? God has put it in us to desire to see victory over evil. It is within us. It, it can get marred over time and through circumstances and situations. But we know that God wants to use us. He wants to use us. Audie Murphy as heroic as he was, was just a man. You and I have the same level of potential for the kingdom of God. Do you believe that? One of the most well-known hero stories that we know we learn as children is none other than the epic saga of David and Goliath. And I just want to set the scene a little bit here. The Philistines, or the Sea Peoples, had come in and invaded into Israel. And there, they had conquered an area which is still being contested over right now. And during this time, the, the armies of God, led by King Saul utterly paralyzed with fear because what they would do sometimes is if you're going to have a battle rather than both armies slaughter each other down to the last man and win or take what's left, you would send forth a champion. You would send forth an Audie Murphy. You would send forth somebody who would stand up and would say, I will do battle against the enemy's champion, and the winner took all. If Goliath wins, then the, other, the Israelite army surrenders and their lands are taken into custody. If the champion from Israel wins, the same happens in reverse. And so that's the stage. They're at a stalemate right now. And don't let the familiarity of this passage of Scripture to many of us stop you for get, from getting what God has for you today. Because I want to take it under the power of the Holy Spirit to a different level today. We're going to dig in today. So please pay attention. So to go ahead and get started, I'm, I just want to read this. It's, it's, it's a fairly long passage, but just bear with me on there because it sets the stage for everything. So in 1 Samuel 17, it'll be 17 to 30. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an epith of dried grain and, ten, and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul uh, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Ethah, fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early the next morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as his father Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and the shout for the battle. Notice, the shout of battle was there, but there was no battle. That'll preach. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David had left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper and ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then, as he talked with them, there was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and will give him his daughter and give him his father's house 
Uh, exemption from taxes in Israel. Who likes exemption from taxes? Come on. Then David spoke to the men who were stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For it is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy, who is this, that he should defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him in this manner saying, so shall be done for the man who kills him. And now really key here. Now Elab, his oldest brother, heard when he had spoke to the men. And Elab, this is his brother, uh, his anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Ouch. Verse 29, and David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? And then he turned towards another and said the same thing, and the people answered him as the first ones did. So this morning, I want to talk to you about, is there a cause? I think many times we don't realize the fact that we are fighting in a battle. We are fighting in a war right now in the spirit realm. We are fighting a battle for the souls of men and women and children all across our towns, our state, our country, and around the world. We are at war. And if you don't realize this, and we go into living our lives in our own little bubble, we're going to miss out on the fact that God wants to raise us up just like Audie Murphy, just like David. He's asking you and I today, is there not a cause? Is there a cause? Is there a reason to stand up now? Is there a reason to make a difference in the lives of those around you? Is there a reason that God has you on this earth at this time, saved your soul, and placed you here this morning or watching online? You are here for a reason. You are the Davids of this generation. So what are we going to do with this situation? Are we just going to consign ourselves to say, well, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Nothing I can do about it. Is that what we're going to do? No. Yes, that's right. Never. And you may be thinking, well, you're no David. You're not a hero. You're not gifted enough. You're not special enough. But every one of those things are a lie because the creator of the universe is in you. And what can't God do? So I want to encourage you today. Now, I just want to take a step back and talk about David's humble beginnings here. You know, he, the reason he was being mocked by his brothers in part was he was the youngest. He had no credibility in his family. And some of you may not feel that you have any credibility today because of what has happened in your lives today. But that is a lie. Just as God used David, he will use you today. Do you want to see this world changed? Do you want to see the captives set free? Do you want to see the enemy defeated? Do you? Amen. Well, God wants to use you. And the word he has for you today is if you will rise up and you will trust him, he will do so. You were brought here for such a time as this. Esther was no supernatural, spiritual monster that could just do it all. David wasn't. Audie Murphy wasn't. Until he went into the military, he was considered pretty much a nobody. An orphan. Poor. He had nothing. And yet God can use us just like he did for Audie when it comes to the spiritual battles and the warfare that we are doing here in our time, in the battle of our day. So 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 13, we see here, and I'm just going to whip through it really quick. Um, 
So Samuel here is, is being told by the Lord to come because the Lord was rejecting Saul because Saul, who started really strong, and I think sometimes we disrespect Saul because we see the end and we don't realize the good things he did uh, for the first half. But Samuel is, is told by the Lord to go and anoint the next king of Israel, which was paramount to treason, right? And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And then he called Jesse, the father of David and, and his brothers. And then he assembled him along with the other elders in the town who were trembling at his coming and said, do you come in peace? Because Samuel had a reputation, you know. Samuel was a mighty prophet who the Bible says not one of his words fell to the ground. So when Samuel showed up, it was going to be amen or oh boy. And so you just hoped it wasn't the oh boy. And so in verse 5 it says, and, he, and I come to make a peace to, to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And when they came, he looked on Elib and and said, surely the, the anointed of the Lord is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, verse 7, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So I want, if you today feel that you're a nobody, great. God's got you. If God can use this, I mean, David, they went through all of the brothers. David wasn't even there. He wasn't even in the running. They kept him in the field, taking care of the animals. But yet God said that one that everybody else rejected, the one that was the nobody, that's who I want. And he was the one who was anointed. And I love the fact that God likes to use us, those of us who are very unlikely. God can take this man who is deathly afraid of being in front of people. Deathly. I remember the first time when I went to Bible college, I knew God had called me to go there. And I remember I was at our first chapel and I was on the far edge corner so that as soon as it was over, I could slip out. And wouldn't you know it, the president of school comes up and hands me the microphone and says, will you close this out in prayer? Really? I thought I was hitting pretty well. <laughs> and then later on, a couple months later, I'm brought to the office along with three others. And then the Lord moved on our president's heart to come and ask if I would go to New York City to do witnessing and street things on the street as well as to the uh, drug and alcohol rehab in New York City. And I'm like, me? I'm going to go. If you haven't been to New York City, it's culture shock if you're not used to it, to say the least. So God called me. So I go to New York City. I'm hanging out in the, it was called the Timothy House at the time. And I'm trying to share the gospel with some of the guys there, trying to be, you know, kind of, you know, slipping there a little low key and all, and just kind of, hey, you know. And, uh, and then I find out that I'm going to be doing a sermon, a message at this place called the Upper Room. And some of you have heard me share this before, but bear with me. So I go to the upper room. It was a second floor. It was on the corner of uh, 42nd Street. And it was an old building that was kind of beat up between there and I think it was 6th Avenue. And uh, so I go up to the top there, totally afraid. And all the homeless folks are coming in there. And there's a lot. And there's a praise band in the front and they're playing some music. I come in the back where some of the sisters were cooking up the meals. 
because we would feed them at, the, at, uh, we, at this place as well as we had a blessing room for those who needed clothes. So I slip out the back, really slinking out, and I find a table in the back that only had one person on it. And so I sit down there, don't say anything. I have my head down like I am worshiping. And then I feel a tap on my shoulder. And I look up, and it's Brother Otis, the director. And he says, as soon as this song is over, go up and give your testimony. What? And the song was almost over. <laughs> so I go ahead, and, I, and I'm like, okay, God. And this became a pattern with God, as he would challenge me to step beyond what I was felt I was able to do. So I go up there and I pick up the microphone and back then they had the cords in them, right? And I pick it up and then the wire falls out. All these eyes are on me. And I'm like, God, what am I doing here? So I reach down, and I pick up the cord, I plug it in and then I begin to speak and my voice was quivering. But as I began to speak, I felt the power of the Holy Spirit come upon me. And next thing you know, I'm preaching it. And I was able to share for 15 minutes, which was the allotted time, just challenging them to find their faith in Jesus Christ, to come up for prayer. A whole bunch of people come up and get prayed for and receive the Lord. Now, what was the magic sauce? It was the Holy Spirit. God has challenged me to put me here today to be able to stand and look at you without a panic attack. He's been able to teach me that through the step-by-step -step obedience and the little things he's been sharing with me to grow me along the way. So if you don't think that God can use you, he will use you. All you need to do is take those little steps and you never know where you're going to end up. And some of you are like, I hope it's not up here because you're deathly afraid of that right now. <laughs> but God will use you. God used David. He was the no-show because he wasn't even invited. So if he can use David, he can use you. Next, I want to talk a little bit about how David responded when he came up there. This shepherd boy... This nobody who sees the injustice of the armies of the enemy defying the armies of the living God. What does he do? He's, he gets up there and he's pretty much, guys, what's going on here? And I, and I don't want us to, to miss this. That he saw the problem, and there, but there was something different about him than the rest. So in verse 29 of 1 Samuel 17, it says, And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? And again, that is the cry for you today. Is there not a cause? Then he turned him towards uh, another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, and this is where those small beginnings like I was talking about come in. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And so Saul says to David, go, the Lord be with you. Now, I, I just want to say again for the first part, like I said, we love to dog Saul, but you got to realize a chance that Saul took in this. I mean, if, if you get some scrawny little guy going, hey, I'm going to take on the armies. I'm going to take on the giant. 
How many of us would be like, got it. Hey, we're going to put all of our fate in your hand because you sound kind of confident. And so for, to his credit, Saul said, do it. He sensed something. Maybe he sensed in his own heart that was slowly turning, remembering where he came from and the faithfulness of God in his earlier days. We don't know for sure. But David's response was so filled with faith and the understanding that the battle belonged to the Lord. Why? Because he was found to have been faithful in the day-to-day -day grind where he was out of sight and out of mind, but still doing the little things. So becoming a David starts with being faithful in the things that you have to do right now. And Jesus echoes this in the parable of the talents. It says in Matthew 25, I'm just going to read a few verses here. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who traveled to a far country who called his own servants and entrusted his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man, I love this, according to his ability. God is not going to call you to do something that he's not going to empower you and equip you to do. You have a specific calling that is geared towards you. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant, for you have been faithful over a little thing, a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter to the joy of your master. And that's the key, brothers and sisters, faithful in the little, faithful in the big. Faithful to hold the mic and say, Lord, bless this time. Faithful in that he's entrusted me to be here today. This is an honor. This is a privilege. This is something that I don't deserve to be up here to, as a pastor to teach and preach. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. There's so many people. I think Pastor Michael said before, there's, there's a ton of people in this room that probably do a better job than us. But God uses us foolish things to confound the wise. So I'm so glad his faithfulness that he uses us. You know, and so if he can use us with our testimonies, our test of failures, then he can use you as well. So will you let him? Will you let him? Will you rise up to that challenge? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause today? Don't let your perceived lack of ability hold you back, but trust in the power of the Holy Spirit who's both with you and in you. And it says right here, I love in Romans 8, 31, it says, what should we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How many things? He will give you everything you need to accomplish what he's pricking your heart to do. You don't have to worry about generating it yourself. I came up here, I have short-term memory issues. If I don't write it down or, or my wife doesn't remind me, I'm in trouble. But I can come up here and God can burn this in me and make it a fire inside of me so that I want to share it and I can't stop. Why? Because the Holy Spirit promised us he would give us what to say. So if he'll do it for me, he will do it for you. Don't you know each one of you is a David or a David? Each one of you has a calling and a purpose. Each one of you has something that needs to be done in your lives. And we'll get into that in just a minute. God used David and he got the victory. We pick up in verse 45 of 1 Samuel 17. It says, Then David said to the Philistine, You have come to me with a sword and a shield, but I have come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The, the God of the armies of Israel for whom you have reviled, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And without going back, you got to remember, David had no armor on, and I didn't mention this in, in the previous, but... but Saul tried to give him his, army, his armor, but it wouldn't fit. And that'll preach as well. Your mold is not somebody else's. 
You don't have to be like me, and you wouldn't want to anyway, but you don't have to be like me or Pastor Aaron. I mean, he's a great preacher. I love listening to the guy. He's, he's my brother, and I can't wait to have him come back. And, but yet, I, I'm not him. I'm not expected to be him. I'm expected to be who God created me to be. And so don't let yourself be intimidated if you're not like someone else. We're not to compare ourselves one with another. But anyway, so this day, verse 46, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Then I will give the corpses of the Philistine camp to this day to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And then all the assembly will know that it is not by sword and by spear that the Lord saves for the battle belongs to the Lord and he will give you into our hands. Listen, I mean, this, 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 Young guy standing against his big, you know, this guy's all decked out, right? And he's like, listen, you're in some really serious trouble. I mean, that's how Goliath saw him. That's how Goliath saw him. He's like, really? You? And, and that's what he says. Listen, uh, verse 48, when the Philistine arose and came to meet near to meet David, David hurried and ran to the battle line to meet the Philistine. He ran to it. He ran at Goliath. He ran towards the lines of the enemy army. David put his hand in his bag and took from there a stone. And he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead. Therefore the stone stunk in his forehead and he fell upon his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck down the Philistine and slew him. And you know, as, as Goliath is going, you know, gasping at the end here, that wasn't enough for David. So then he ran and stood over the Philistine. He took his sword and drew it from its sheath. And when he finished, he, he finished him off. He cut his head off with it. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. This guy, I mean, I don't even pick up the sword. And yet, because God was with him, this unlikely hero, this unlikely Audie Murphy, who his own brother said, dude, why are you here? You don't even belong here. You're just here for the show. Well, us real men are here. And he's like, you real men ain't doing nothing. But I'm going to because I trust in God. Because I've been faithful in the little things. And I know if I'm faithful in the little things, that God is going to use me in the bigger things. And if God delivered me the hand the, of the bear and the lion to my hand, then there's Philistine stands no chance. Because God is with me and there's nothing that they can do to stop me. Listen, you are just as valuable. The same Holy Spirit that came upon David is available for you today. So what's your David story? Is there not a cause? Is there a David inside you waiting to live out your own epic story? I believe so. You know how I know? First of all, because it's in the Word of God. And secondly, because you are a child of God and have that same Holy Spirit in you. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are poised to be a David in some way if you can just believe that God wants to use your life. And just, well, yeah, show me in the Bible. Okay. Second Chronicles 6, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Let me ask you, are you on the earth? Now, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're on one of the Apollo missions, you might have a, you know, never mind. Next one in Romans 15, four, for whatsoever was previously written was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. These things were written. These things are written. These are examples. Do you think God used hero after hero after hero? Unlikely. Who was Rahab? She didn't fight a battle, but she was faithful. If God, is God going to use this pattern throughout 
all of history, and then suddenly in painful assembly of God today, well, we don't do that anymore. Do you think God has stopped using people in mighty ways? Jesus said, greater things you're going to do because I go to be with my father. There is no limit to what God can do in your life. But you have to overcome the fear. And you have to overcome the lethargy. Because it's so easy for us to say, wow. Oh. And, and this may not make me popular with some people. But sometimes we have so overbooked our lives we don't leave room for the Holy Spirit. I would serve God, but I don't have time. I got these 5,000 things to do today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. Maybe when I'm 90, should the Lord tarry, I might have a free day. And then inside, we're like dying. We're like, God, there's got to be more to life than this. And the answer is, well, yeah, there is. But if we're filling our stuff with the things that the world says is valuable... And we're neglecting, and again, it don't, don't misunderstand me, there are things we do. We take care of our families, we work our jobs, we do things in the community. I get that. But if we neglect to make those spaces for God to move in our lives, then we're going to be empty inside. Because you were meant for more than just watching the time clock and running the kids to and fro. There's so much more to that. So we're going to go ahead and close and the uh, worship team can come up. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, uh, the first part uh, in the J.B. Phillips. I like the J.B. Phillips. He was a pretty good scholar, just did the New Testament, but it's really nice. It says, now these things which happened to our ancestors are illustrations of the way in which God works. So these things that God has done in the past are examples of how he works. And if you read through the book of Acts, what are you going to find? You're going to find example after example of example of the early church moving in power and changing lives and winning the world. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God didn't stop. So will you today be a David? And maybe you're saying you're too far gone or there's no hope. There's no turning it around. I want you to know that can't be farther from the truth. Even if right now you've messed up a million times and you think I'm not worthy. I would say to you then with a holy, so what? We never were worthy. This isn't about a self-help thing. This is about a God help. Our identity is found in Christ and our power is the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, what can't God do? And if you can hear the sound of my voice today and have a heart that's not hardened, you're in a good place today and God wants to use each one of you. Ezekiel 22. I recommend reading this passage at home. Verses 23 to 31. I'm just going to summarize most of it. But during the time of Ezekiel, Israel was really messed up. Not unlike we're going through today in our culture. If I was to read through some of these things, you would see a, 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 a similarity between what was going on then and now. They, they take treasures and precious things. They make many widows within her. Her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They do not dispute between the holy and the common. They teach there's no difference between the unclean and the clean. They shut their eyes off to keeping my Sabbath so that I am profaned amongst them. Uh, her politicians within her are like wolves tearing their prey and they shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. That doesn't happen now. Her prophets whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. They say, this is what the sovereign Lord says when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy. They mistreat the foreigner. They deny them justice. And then God says this, I looked for someone 
among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land that I would so I would not have to destroy it but I found no one are we going to let that happen today Are we going to allow the Lord to say, I wanted to save the people in this county. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to change lives. I wanted to bring revival and renewal, but I couldn't find anybody who would stand up and do it. They just wanted church on Sunday, say their grace at the table and act like good little Christians or just throw some money at it. And there's nothing wrong with supporting things. But God has called you and I for such a time as this. You are here for a very powerful reason to be the David to your generation. Will you stand up and let the Lord use your life today? Will you sell out for second or third rate? Or do you want to stand before the Lord and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear that. I don't know about you. So will you stand up and be counted amongst the faithful of God? Will you slay the giants that God would have you slay? It doesn't matter where you're at today. It doesn't matter if you're weak or strong, young or old. God uses anyone who's willing. No matter what you think you can do or can't do, I want you to know that God wants to use you. Don't put limits on yourself that God has not put on you. Will you stand with me? And some people, if they want to come up for those who want to come up for prayer, some prayer team folks. On the back of his book, Goliath Must Fall, Louis Giglio has summarized the battle we face by saying, it is likely you have a threatening giant in your life, an adversary or stronghold that's diminishing your ability to live a full and free life, frozen in the grip of rejection, fear, anger, comfort, or addiction. We lose sight of the promise God has for our lives, demoralized, and defeated, we settle for far less than his best. God has a better plan for you, a plan for you to live in victory. Do you believe that today? God has a plan. I'm gonna close in prayer and when the worship team is gonna play, and if you want prayer, if you are like, yes, Pastor Kevin, today, Today, I want to be a a world changer. I want my life to have significance more. I know there's something more that God has for me. The Holy Spirit is making the appeal through me. So if your heart is pricked, don't worry about if you're the only one who comes. Because it only took one David. So if you want prayer, come on. And we'll pray with you as the as the worship team sings. Lord God, we love you. God, I just pray for a Holy Spirit conviction on our hearts, Lord God. God, you are so much more than what our lives are on their own. God, you desire to use each one of us mightily. God, I pray you give us a vision for what it means to live for you, to be world changers, God, to be Goliath slayers. Goliath may look like he's big and intimidating in our lives, but Lord, you are greater, far greater. And so Lord, we trust you and we ask you, Lord, to raise in us the courage to be giant slayers. Speak to our hearts right now. Guide us and direct us. Help us to be faithful in the little things. And we give you the praise and glory and honor. Amen.